This is the OGM call for um, Monday, so Thursday, May 23rd, 2024. Um, we're revisiting the topic of generative AI. Uh, Marshall is kindly joining us kind of as co-host and uh, co-instigator for the interesting topics of, so how, how does this stuff actually uh, benefit or hinder us? I, I think we're, I'm, I've been looking at um, the generative AI capacities as more or less superpowers that there are things that we couldn't do before that all of a sudden are accessible and available. And, and there's a whole jagged frontier to explore there. And I think uh, here we can explore them together, but it's going to change a lot of stuff. And Marshall, yeah. I, I think you had a brief, uh, brief sort of presentation you wanted to do, and uh, we can start there. Great. Yeah, thanks so much. Everybody uh, and Jerry, thanks for asking me to to come back. I, I I always like participating in OGM calls whenever I can, um, and I've got some capacity now. But as uh, I am a, a free agent, uh, which I haven't been able to tell my my good friend Dave Gray yet because my emails to him keep uh, bouncing back. Uh, but uh, that's a, that's another matter. Uh, so I, I I'm glad to. Uh, be able to participate today. I've got a, a much shorter little couple of things to share uh, than last week that I want to is to kind of queue up the conversation. Uh, and I really look forward to hearing everybody else's perspective on this. Uh, I, I want to start by sharing uh, my friend Gianni's uh, excellent article here, uh, decomposing what it means say that AI might augment uh, our our work. Uh, he split up into two parts of uh, you know, a, a simple model of capabilities and effort. Where he says uh, AI can do a great job of adding capabilities, especially where you are not an expert, and it can do a great job of adding effort. Uh, where it will run multiple iterations of a process that would be too arduous uh, for uh, for you to repeat necessarily in a short period of time. Uh, I've had that on my mind for days uh, at, since he wrote it um, and have been um, thinking about uh, other ways that we can understand AI uh, as a, a power of augmentation. And I'll, I'll show you a little tool that I've put together here that facilitated some thinking um, that uh, that led me to, to add to the, the list. Uh, I think these are distinct categories. Um, parallel processing, uh, AI can add to our, our work and uh, from the like a, a biological ecosystems perspective, uh, the concept of nutrient cycling or uh, helping uh, tap into otherwise latent knowledge that uh, that that our human minds uh, can't necessarily keep track of and remember. Oh, this would be a good time to bring that up. Um, that feels a little different than capabilities and, and effort. I don't know how distinct they are, uh, but I, I'm going to finish with uh, with showing you something that that I put together a couple of weeks ago that I've been using pretty consistently. Um, uh, but I, uh, I I see it in a new light uh, after reading uh, a particular section of April Rennie's book, uh, Flux, uh, Jerry's partner, uh, April. Uh, this book is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, and the the section on seeing what's, uh, what's invisible or in particular uh, bolstering our peripheral vision uh, as a, a core skill in living and thriving in a time of flux feels like that might be a, a good framing for this tool that I have, have started to put together. I have been thinking of it as a, a historian, uh, an advisory historian. I've, uh, oh, uh, let's see, I'm, my, I just got a little, okay, my, uh, my power is in flux. Um, so I'm gonna be brief, I'm gonna plug myself in. Okay, good. Yeah long held that uh, I wish every organization had a staff historian so we could say hey this idea you've got it has been done before uh or we've done something related before but who who's willing to pay a staff historian 
uh, unfortunately not uh, even fewer people than are willing to to pay a, a staff librarian um but so i thought to myself why don't i build one and uh and so i have uh started to to do a little no code version of that um, in a spreadsheet and uh what i've what i've done here is i've made a system where each day i copy my template into a spreadsheet and i drop my uh, my notes uh, my reading notes from things that I'm I'm thinking about, things that I'm reading, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, here into one column. And then I've got this cascading series of uh, API calls to GPT-40 uh, processing uh, and iterating on that that information. So I'll show you what they are uh, real quick. And, and gen I can imagine generalizing this in any number of different ways. Uh, but one of the one of the key steps I figured out was let's abstract from the original note and determine what some of the key concepts are that are discussed there. Um, and then in the uh, the second column, we refer back to B, and we say uh, I I say to uh, GPT four, please make a ten point highlight reel of the key historical events on this topic since the year nineteen hundred. And so it it assembles a little quick and dirty, you know, it's a peripheral vision matter. It's not as precise and detailed as with your primary focus, uh, but it sure does uh, paint a, a, a groovier picture than uh, than my mind is, is capable of doing on the fly uh, on any kind of, of subject that's being discussed. Then I ask in the next column to put the note in column A into the context in history C. So uh, you can see how that works. Uh, and that's the key uh, column really that I spend my, uh, my time uh, on. Uh, but there's more. Uh, I've come in and said, uh, please make a list of the three best decisions that organizations or individuals made in this historical timeline. Uh, and uh, and that's pretty fun and interesting. Please give me a, a list of the three worst decisions uh, historically that have been made uh, in this timeline. And, and it's pretty subjective. I could, you know, give it more specific instructions, give it, you know, my criteria for what's a good decision or a bad decision. Uh, but I, I'm just getting started here. Uh, I've, uh, I've then uh, come in and said, uh, for each of those historical elements, please give me one primary and one secondary limiting factor as to why this historical element didn't drive more change than it did. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, a wild card column, and then a series of uh, of lenses. Or I've said, please uh, draw either literal or metaphorical uh, perspectives uh, on the subject of this note from the world of physics computer programming and software uh, engineering, ecology and sustainability, feminist and anti-racist scholarship. And those are the, the four lenses I've got right now. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is a lot of reading that just got produced uh, out of each one individual note. So now I'm experimenting with uh, asking it for each row to pull out the three most high leverage and the three most counterintuitive Ooh. points raised in all of the above, uh, compiling them into a set and then making one uh, meta highlight reel of just from all of the above, uh, give me you know the, the three most high leverage, three most counterintuitive uh, points raised in this entire discussion. The whole thing, I just dropped my notes in here. Whole thing takes under five minutes, costs about a buck and a half. Uh, and uh, the big challenge is is consuming it, but I have taken to uh, copying this uh, column here to a, a text file, emailing it to myself, and then using the Apple text-to-speech to read these highlights to myself while I clean my kitchen. Um, Good Lord. So um, before, before all of us lose our minds, could you forage for power quickly and plug yourself back in? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll introduce uh, some some audio and video changes because uh, I sent my my only cord I've got back to my my former day job, so I'm going to plug into an external monitor. So uh, uh, that's oh, okay. that's a good chance for me to make sure I'm not taking up too much space. So thank you for for your uh, your time and consideration and. Uh,
thanks for for the invite to OGM again. Yeah, not at all. I think we have to gather up our brains a little bit uh, to wrap them around what you've just shown us. Um, and and one of the things that really struck me kind of early in this process was, yeah, if I have a software agent, I don't have to have just one software agent. I could easily have like dozens of software agents out doing my bidding. And I, I couldn't wrap my head around that. It was like, uh, how do I manage the parallel processing? What? So the problems that programmers and computer architects hit when they started doing parallel processing, like, oh, okay, how do we do thread management? How do we do concurrency control? I'm forgetting all any of the technical terms about parallel processing that they've solved three or four different times in different ways as parallel processing matured. We now have to solve for our workflows. And that's just one of the issues at hand. Um, that's kind of kind of wacky. Uh, so Gil and Jesse. Um, yeah. Um picking our brains up off the floor. Um, really cool, Marshall. Um, uh, um, I, I've already forgotten what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, it's okay. It's, it, 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 it's really provocative, intriguing what you've done. I like the workflow that you've set up for the, uh, for, uh, for the software process on this. And I'm wondering more if you could tell us more about your workflow with this. You talked about how you consume. I don't know if consuming is the right word, but how do you interact with this thing? What does it do for you? Uh, does it help you focus or does it make your life more diffuse? Because we have here the possibility of, you know, of essentially infinite input about things that we care about. What do we do with that? So I'm very interested in the Marshall side of this Excel thing that you've showed us, not what's in the spreadsheet, although I'd love to see that too at another time. Yeah, uh, I'm, curious, so. I'm curious about what you plan to do with this thing. But the main question is, how do you live with this thing? What does it do for you? How does it affect your life and well-being? and effects so, and so forth. Yeah, that's a, those are great questions. Historically, I've taken my notes from Obsidian from reading and thinking and put them into Anki spaced repetition flashcards, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I spend five minutes a, a day reviewing unless my wife has watched an episode of Grey's Anatomy the night before, at which point I feel guilty for spending less than 10 minutes uh, on it uh, to see the intensity of the doctors studying, you know? Uh, but I, uh, uh, now with this output here, I mean, I'm pretty intrigued by this read, meditate, pray, contemplate four steps, uh, from, uh, from Lectio Divina, but as, uh, as that note was put in historical context, uh, that was from an era like pre-printing press when reading was, uh, was a, a precious, uh, opportunity. And now... Now it's a little different. I really like uh, April's uh, discussion of peripheral vision. So I'm thinking of uh, relating to this as peripheral vision. Sometimes I'll see things come up in this and I'll say, ooh, I need to dive deeper in that. And I'll go Google it and read in greater detail. Uh, like, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the augmentation of, uh, of human labor uh, is tied into... Uh, the the creation of uh, uh, the, I've read a, a part of the history that came up that about that was the first uh, factory robot, and I learned that the man who had invented that first factory arm robot had previously been involved in a science project called the Speedy Weenie, um, which was uh, the first microwave hot dog cooker. Wow. Um, I thought that was pretty great. So. Oh, so this is exactly. I thought that was a comment about Trump's sex life. Sorry. Yeah. So this is exactly. <laughs> this is exactly where my concern is. <laughs> uh, what, you're, what you're describing is exactly my concern uh, because this sounds like squirrel, 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 squirrel. What? This what, is automated squirrel generation. Automated squirrel generation. So the question is, why are you doing this? For the sake of what? What are you hoping to to generate, evoke, enable for you in doing this thing? Yeah. Because what so, I'm seeing so far is is fascinating, and I want to run away from it because I need less distraction, not more distraction. I, 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 I don't think you're after more distraction. There's something else that you're not telling us. No, it is a challenge. Yeah. So uh, so historically, uh, when working as a journalist, or sometimes uh, engaging as a commentator or advisor, um, I have. Uh, been uh, fortunate enough to get just enough uh, advance notice on the topic that I'd be covering uh, mm -hmm. that I either could in real time or would have previously uh, built a Google custom search engine. 
mm -hmm. uh, where Google can uh, give you a URL you can visit and you can say, just search these 10 domains in mm -hmm. particular. And so I've got one of the top analyst firms, uh, you know, I'll, I'll spin up one top English language uh, blogs about the Chinese tech industry and what have you. And, and then I'll go in and I'll do searches for what I'm writing about or what I'm advising about um, and be able to bring to that conversation uh, perspective informed by the archival content of those subject matter experts. And people say, oh, you just happen to have read that blog post three years ago and have instant recall of it. And no, I constrained, you know, my search. Uh, but part of the inspiration behind this is what if I had the AI create a, a lightweight version of that custom search engine in the form of the historical timeline and mm -hmm. do the comparisons for me? So mm -hmm. I'm going to scan over this and I'm going to pick up uh, things that will enrich and deepen my ability to uh, to comment on and advise uh, the people and organizations in in making strategic and operational decisions. That's my goal. Okay, gotcha. Virtually, yeah. you you could start just a podcast with like exploding topics in this way, and that would people would show up. I mean, just to see where these things go, because you kind of want to see what you hit and what makes sense, and then what the what the filter bag pulls up at the end. Because because the net is big, the net just goes bam right, and then I like that you're you're adding some sorting and sifting to it as best you can to get some like nutrients at the end. I think that that whole process is fascinating. One one, one last comment. Thank you for this whole thing. Um, um, my wife has been railing against the term artificial intelligence for a decade or more, and she's been preferring to talk about simulated intelligence. Uh, we've been lately exploring the term augmented intelligence, which is how I'm experiencing this gadget. And that's very much what you're talking about here, as you said at the top. So thank you for this. Thanks, Gil. Um, John, the floor is yours. And for those who missed it at the top of the call, John just on Monday went through cancer surgery, lost a piece of a kidney and, and other sorts of things and is healing right now and looking pink and wonderful, which is great, but not not feeling wonderful. So thanks for being here, John. Yes. OK, thank you. So, um, and I apologize if this has already been covered in an earlier uh, conversation with Marshall. Of course, the, when I get, when you got to the column about uh, high leverage and counterintuitive, I think the, the noun there was decisions or actions. Um, those, I, those flashed on my screen right away because those were of course the things we went for when we were designing scenarios. You know, we would say, well, what were the, what are the high leverage decisions and, and also, let's, what's counterintuitive and therefore might be overlooked. My question is more, I mean, those are clearly very valuable things to have. Um, my question is how good are the uh, LLMs or whatever it is you're using at discovering that? Because it strikes me that that, unlike some other uh, sorts which benefit greatly just from the sheer magnitude of the data that's being um, scanned those require you know it's, it's to me what is a considerably more complex uh, application of the criteria so so how well do the tools uh, do at finding high, le high leverage and counterintuitive you know i uh, my friend jason glasby uh, talks about uh, using ai when you need b level work on tasks that you probably didn't have the bandwidth to do yourself and so far uh with with real limited uh i mean i've just asked you know zero shot as they say pick out high leverage things it feels like it's doing b level work uh, I feel like I could go in and give it some a list of examples of some of my favorite uh, high leverage and counterintuitive things, and it would probably improve it. Uh, I just put that into the prompt, uh, but out of the box, it's it, it's uh, it's a heck of a lot better than nothing, and it's pretty good. It inspires a lot of thinking. Okay, that's good. Thanks. I'm done. Please. You're going to have to unmute. There you go. Good. Okay. Um, by the time I'm done with this, I might wish I hadn't muted myself. Um, what's striking to me 
is that this approach creates an avalanche of new paper uh, coming onto my desk, into my head, into my computer. And what's striking about all this text is it's pretty intelligent, pretty interesting, but there's no person there. And I find that when I read, uh, a large part of my thinking is trying to figure out who this is and what their motives are and what's going on. It's all absent in this pile of paper. Uh, so it seems to me that it's increasing our workload tremendously. Uh, and I don't know if we want to do that or not. Um, yeah, I think that's a real good question. I mean, to to solve a to try to solve a tech problem with a, a tech solution, uh, which I don't know is the right approach. Uh, one of my my next experiments is going to be to create a cell uh, in which to put my goals for the day, uh, as well as some of my values and, and what have you, and really have those inform as much as possible the uh, the the text recommendations uh, being used, you know, to populate those cells. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's an eerie, weird uh, deluge of. Uh, so let me take my comment one step further, which is what I find is my reaction to this is it puts in question the motive as to why write. Uh, what's the purpose of writing? And what's the purpose of reading? And of course the text answer is it's uh, better organized information. But I don't believe that. I don't think that's why we act uh, in the, as an agent in the political or social sphere. We're doing it for other reasons that have to do with personhood and identity. Uh, and that just more good ideas is not helpful. So I'll stop there. I'm struck also that you, Marshall, your examples got me thinking, oh, hell man, uh, a really good blogging strategy or now Substack strategy is to take the day's news and interpret it from your lens and then give it that particular spin. Um, I could, without all too much effort, create a prompt that sets up my perspective and then ask uh, you know, the system to sift through the day's uh, you know, dross and find the, the nuggets of, of wheat in there and just put them in front of me. It doesn't, it could then write a post and post on my behalf, but it doesn't need to, but it could be more alert than me and it could be more sensible than me to the things that might actually matter and feed me a series of balls on a, on a little T-ball stick so that I can just go, you know, swing, swing, swing. And it's still me, Doug, you know, uh, hitting the ball, but I now, don't have to be completely um, dissipated with my own attention because I'm busy trying to find things like that. And it's, it's, it's work and it's an open loop in my head all the time and I'm not very successful at it. Um, so that, that's, and that's just one scenario that presents itself. So, um, Stuart. Yeah, I guess this is a, a pick up on, 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 on Doug's comment in some ways. Um, I appreciate the power, but I think we have to be really discerning and using it. Um, uh, listening to you, Marshall, I could see myself at some point in time taking my machine and throwing it against the wall because of the over the, because of the, the overload, it was provided uh, data. But as I was sitting here thinking about it, I could say, you know, um, you could be very discerning and say, give me the top five pieces or something, something of that nature so that you're not totally overloaded and inundated with, with data to the, to the point where it's just frustrating. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. And on some level, you know, the, that, that, when you say it that way, it reminds me of how we felt when RSS was invented. Uh, and when, when microblogging hit the scene, you know, there's, there's a, a risk of, of overwhelm, but an opportunity to, uh, to filter and discover and have serendipity. And, uh, but part of it requires letting go. Uh, like I, I, I don't remember all the things that the spreadsheet brought up about my notes yesterday, but I do remember a few of them. What you yeah, just so said. It, so just, I'm sorry, Jerry. 
So it, 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 it does really require a certain level of mindfulness and discernment um, to preserve one's own sanity in, in, in some sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Marshall, what you just said reminds me of why I miss Twitter so much. Um, I remember the day, uh, apropos RSS feeds, where I would go into Google Reader and I would struggle to, there'd be a mountain of things I, 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 that, that were there to read from lots of different sources that I was following mm -hmm. and I would get through almost nothing. And then Twitter shows up and in a 140 characters, somebody has to say something or, or point to something worth reading. And so Twitter became my advanced early warning system for stuff that was happening at the time in the day, because I would hear news first there, but also for interesting stuff everywhere from people I cared to follow. And I was trying to be very mindful about who I followed, but that social arrangement of where I was, where I was paying attention and what they were paying attention to and were forced to condense into 140 characters, damn it, they then doubled it to two, you know, to 280 and then now all bets are off. But th that squeezing, factor made Twitter incredibly more productive for me than Reader, for example. And it was a simple set of UI decisions, uh, including the platform that said, hey, all messages have to be really short. And I think that's a brilliant constraint. Like haiku is a great constraint that gives us a particular kind of poetry, right? And, and so knowing where to put the squeeze and where to force something and where to put the human, I think is part of what our design challenge is now. Um, because it could easily explode into this multivariate, overwhelming sea of impersonal info, but it doesn't have to, right? It could actually, it could actually not do that. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm trying to chase that promise. I think that's great. I, I think um, it, it could also be be good to think beyond the individual level too, in organizational and ecosystem terms. And there may be some of us who want the you know I, I'm like a, a an awe driven like quantity oriented person that just like you know you give me a a, a news sort or a stream of data where one out of a hundred items are actionable and I'll say oh can I have more of those please that sounds great one out of a hundred is a great ratio uh, but there are other people in the in the ecosystem that frankly have different skills and interests than than I do. Uh, who who need a real different ratio of signal to noise, and uh, and so it, it's important. I think uh, or one one model that I'm kind of exploring is don't give this to just anybody. Uh, only give this to or you know don't expect everyone to love it. Uh, you know some of us some of us will, and others of us will play different roles in the in our our collective processing of of information. Um, many, many years ago, Kenneth Tyler, who's in the OGM circle and built SeedWiki years ago, he said, this is before Twitter existed, he said, wouldn't it be cool if there was a service that let you peek over the shoulder of six people in different domains whose opinion you really valued and just see what they see? And that's kind of what Twitter did, right? Twitter pulled that off for a while. Um, sorry, Klaus, thanks for your patience. Yeah, no, I, I'm coming at this from a from a somewhat different perspective. And and I really resonated with this article that you published, Jerry, from the consultant uh, approach, because I think that's sort of what I'm using this for. So I just uh, um, posted a conversation I had with the GPT about uh, a new uh, a, a new module I'm I'm ready to release and we're we're field testing it now. So you can see what this is trained to do. But to give you another example, um, I was in a conversation last week with a group that is advocating for a carbon tax, uh, but wasn't aware of what a carbon tax really means to the agricultural sector. So in the conversation, uh, I asked the question, I mean, I went to the, GB, to the uh, GBT and, and asked, uh, give me a calculation on the impact of a carbon tax on synthetic nitrogen. You know what? How much cost would the carbon tax add? And it came up. I mean, in an amazingly short time, that for every ten dollars of a carbon fee, it would add three billion dollars to the cost of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers to American farmers. And they they wanted to you know advocate for a one hundred dollar per ton 
uh, fee. So, so it's the, I mean, I'm aware that there's a high usage of synthetic nitrogen. I'm aware that it uses huge volumes of uh, gas to produce the ammonia, but how do you translate this into you know, a picture that makes sense? So this is how you can how you can use this, but I also agree that you can't just hand this to someone who isn't trained to to work with it. You know, it it does uh, it does have amazing strengths, <clears throat> but then on the other hand, mm -hmm. it's also pretty dumb in some in 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 uh, in some ways. You now, so so this but this uh, uh, technical service providers thing. You know, the, uh, the uh, USDA is, is looking to hire 4,000 people. They can't find them. So far, they haven't even had 500. And they urgently need these, these specialists, develop these specialists in order to execute on the $20 billion they just got from, from the Inflation Reduction Act. So there are some really practical applications, you know, um, and and uh, uh, and and that opens up, and, and I think that was expressed in the article that uh, Jerry sent around. You know, a forty percent product productivity increase. So that's sort of in my mind how that how that transpires. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, Gil. <laughs> yeah, I want to come back to what Doug said, but first, Klaus, to your point, um, um, I guess I guess several people have said this. Um, um, well, look, there's, we're having two different conversations here. Uh, one is about how we would use this stuff. And one is about how other people would use this stuff in the world. And it's already out there. We can't talk about only releasing it to some people because this is out of the box. It's never going back in the box. Uh, and so we have to deal with that. And um, um, uh, one of the consequences that we're already talking about here is the flood of new content that will result from this. And what concerns me about that is the is, is the is the recursivity is AIs training on material generated by AIs training on material generated by AIs, and it's kind of a regression to the mean on steroids. My concern about that. Um, um, I, Doug, I really appreciate your question about about why write. Um, it's not for better organized information. It's for the sake of something that we care about. And what is that? Um, and, um, um, you know, the thing that's striking to me about AI is that I've been working actively for like the last six months in my own sandbox, building stuff and playing, you know, kind of learning by doing. Uh, this This stuff doesn't care. And it can't. And human beings do, and maybe you all, you know, maybe all or most living beings do, and it may be that that's a fundamental distinguishing difference between us and the technologies that we're building, um, and that's okay, because you know, like my hammer doesn't care, but this thing seems like it does, and the 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 possibility of us be of of losing our boundaries and perspective and thinking that we're dealing with something that's different than what we're dealing with. You know, I mean, Marshall, you've built a spreadsheet that does certain things for you to enhance your capacity. I would I would use the word capacity rather than what did you use? Um, um, capabilities, and you say cap capabilities and effort. I would say I was I, I would hear that as capacity as capabilities and capacity. Uh, and so carefully designed for that. Terrific. Um, once people start seeding their own, not just their own autonomy, but their own their own human care and compassion to the machine, which seems to do that, you know, like our little Scarlett Johansson clone, AI clone of a clone of something that speaks with emotionality and relationship. And, you know, you just go back to remember how how entrained people were on Liza, which was Eliza, which was rudimentary and programmatic. And this is just, you know, worlds more sophisticated than that. And these things don't care. And humans do. And um, I would argue uh, that that's a fundamental underlying question in this entire conversation about AI. You know, I, I, if I can interject uh, or respond to that, I, I, just before this call, I read the ProPublica article about Forever Chemicals that just came out with the New Yorker here this week. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 3M New is basically the angle. And, and I, and I, I hate to be a downer, but when we say, you know, machines don't care, humans do, uh, it, that comes to mind where, you know, at scale with profit motive, not all humans do. 
No, no, I, I disagree. Those executives at 3M care. They cared more about profit than about your body. But they care. There's a re there's there's a human, biological, emotional, et cetera, reason, reason's not the right word, phenomenon behind all the things that humans do. Uh, I'm just asserting, and you know, uh, this is uh, 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 B. Roos and Fernando Flores have been beating on this for you know for a couple of years about the fundamental uh, uh, distinction of care underlying humans and underlying our language and everything we do. And that's you know this goes back to Hubert Dreyfus's uh, why computers can't think in the 1980s, uh, which I would encourage anybody looking at AI to go back and you know uh, see Dreyfus's book and his book another I think 10 or 15 years later about why computers still can't think. Uh, and it's been uh, well neglected in the in the tech world, but it's really worth digging back into. <clears throat> Marshall, there's a question kind of brewing in the chat about sense making that I'd like to come back to. Or I'd like to go, go to Kevin first, but <clears throat> but I'll frame that a little bit just to to kick it around. Which is uh, what you what you showed us wasn't necessarily a sense making tool. It was some kind of a collection and filtering tool. And there's lots of tools that are imaginable. Um, but how does this all? How might this all contribute to sense making? And and are there any reasons why it might not? Why it might make more chaos and havoc? Or are there any reasons why we might be hopeful that this might help us make more sense than we've been able to as mere humans collaborating? So bookmark that for a second. Let me go to Kevin, and I'll I'll come back and restate that. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, and I think sense making. Uh, I'll just respond to that and then say what I was going to say. Uh, sense making, I think, is a collective enterprise anyway. Uh, you're influenced by all these people around you, and you often are much less aware of it than you think you are. And you're also, you know, influenced by uh, your dead relatives in the, who are not in the room who you're trying to perform up to their standard. And you know, it's a, you know, as, as Faulkner said, you know, the past is not even past. Uh, it's maybe a Mississippi perspective on on uh, time. Uh, but I think we, we are all influenced by everybody, and, and we often imagine that we're not influenced. I think we're more influenced by other people than we are our biology um, or all those sorts of things. But I, I just want to talk about people doing bad things. I had breakfast one time with the CEO of Monsanto, and um, we got to a place where we could understand each other because I had had a business that ended up. It was a really good idea, but it ended up doing bad things to poor folks. Uh, it became the largest pre-employment screening uh, thing in the country, which means you can search for uh, workforce fraud, but you really can search that if anybody ever, uh, not, I mean, uh, disability, you know, what, what is that thing that, that, that you know, where you workplace, uh, you need to be paid for, for being hurt in the workplace. I can't think of the name of it. Workplace compensation. Yeah. yeah, you can you can search for work fraud, but actually they search for anybody who dared to raise their their voice, and uh, they did it in in industries that had a more than a hundred percent turnover, which was uh, commercial cleaning and trucking, so that they had less power and were more able to go and and they they victimized them and they they went upstream from that, but they. They, they used it as a tool to victimize the poorest folks who were the most vulnerable. And so, and he talked about, you know, yeah, he was stuck at a company doing bad things too, you know, and that he didn't like what they had to do, but, you know, sometimes he gets stuck there. And so, you know, he, he was a decent guy who, uh, then he had to do what he had to do. Then he uh -huh. ended up doing really bad things. Kevin, you're reminding me about some often negative power of maps and mapping. And uh, for many cultures around the world, when the surveyor showed up was when you needed to get worried because the surveyor is just like with a stick and a compass and walking around your property, you know, your land and what, what you don't know, whatever. <clears throat> and he says, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna have a map of this. The map's gonna be really useful. And guess what? The map is gonna be like how they decide where to put the railroad or you know where, where to take your land and all that. It's, it's them calculating how much land and assets that might be present uh, to seize in some cases. Uh, not always, but 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 sometimes the tools are 
they're two-edged. They can be used for good or for, for evil. And now there's this sort of indigenous mapping efforts to try to take back a lot of control over their lands and assets. But, but one of the dangers for indigenous mapping is when you actually put your assets onto a map that someone else can read, they're like, oh, good, we can go seize those assets now. So you have to be yeah. really careful <clears throat> about who has access and how this all works. All very, all very twisty and intertwingly. Technology, not so simple, people. Um, yeah, the uh, book Maps and Dreams is really good at that. There was a guy that <clears throat> had to map the assets uh, that the indigenous had in Canada, but in First Nations had to get oil severance money, but he had to do it both in terms of the story of the tribe and then the surveying and to make sure that the people doing the story of the tribe felt the map was okay. And they had to explain, like one thing I remember is that uh, they were mapping uh, a beaver pond and the, the white folks said it's not being managed. And this is no, it's something we harvest in four years. And so the, the white folks weren't able to think about a four year build to when it was harvestable. And so they had to, do all, it, it's really good book because uh, he, he he both the story made sense to the First Nations and to the the, the power company. Uh, anyway, yeah, that, that's a great reference, Kevin. Thank you. Um, uh, let's go to Doug and Judy, and then uh, keep going. Go ahead, Doug. Um, as I hear the goal of Marshall's uh, intent here. It's to have a better representation of all the world's data. Uh, but that, then, that tends to pull it into a single system, which is the infrastructure for uh, deep monopoly in the world, which I take it to be a kind of bureaucratic state uh, that's relatively fascist in its uh, relation to everybody else. Uh, and I find that. Uh, deeply disturbing. Thanks, Doug. Marshall, do you want to address that or? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I too am, am torn by like the excitement of, of the augmented learning experience and the, and the joy of discovering new connections and new things with, uh, uh, on the other hand, a, a concern of, uh, yeah, where, where all this could go and having the centralization. And I mean, the last two weeks ago, we talked about running uh, AI open source on your own local computer. Um, and so there's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know yet it, it's it's a there's a great degree of uncertainty there Ken Wilbur's you know the the solution to every problem includes the seeds of the next problem comes to my mind um and yeah we'll see uh I, I'm I'm happy I'm really happy to be spending time here in this in this group uh, hearing uh informed and heartfelt discussions about those concerns that's a conversation I want to participate in. Marshall. Uh, Judy, please. You'll have to unmute though. Sorry, I do that routinely because my phone can be very annoying. Um, I think the challenge is really a complex one because it would be sad if we came to rely only on some artificial source of intelligence because it would compromise the human thought process. And I think it's important to have diversity of values in the perspective that's provided, which again re requires individuals rather than machines because the machine isn't going to integrate particular social emphasis or other factors that would influence an individual's perception. Um, so I, I find the whole thing a little troubling in the sense that even now when I try to find information without per se using AI, I end up going to multiple sources to get divergent perspectives to inform my decision making about the information process. And I think the world's getting so complex that becomes rather time consuming. <laughs> um, and so some assistance would be helpful. 
But I think at the same time, over-reliance on that system and the opportunity for it to sort of be unfettered in the sense of the, the value framework behind it as a trusted source is a big issue to deal with. Yep. I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, something like this, uh, that, that what I showed in that spreadsheet today, uh, feels like a, a rather rudimentary uh, version of the process. And we, we look back and say, okay, you've got a, a set of, of uh, parallel processing uh, assistant synthesizing things here, but show me the show me the prompt and like really what are the values and what are the and and how deep is this going and what are you doing with the output uh, before you know uh, just showing up and and saying uh, you know here is a piece of relevant knowledge uh, where did you get it well it got spit out on a spreadsheet like mm -hmm. that's just the just the beginning a little a little humble assistant. You could imagine the thing that ends up as the product at the end of the spreadsheet, something you could still sort of check, verify, and also sort of gut check and verify in the sense of it might be a hallucination, but that's, you could kind of figure that out. Mm -hmm. And also every now and then, I think these hallucinations are actually going to be things that humans weren't going to think of, but are actually likely and real. Uh, and we've got to be careful not to think that those are false positives in, in, in some sense. Those are actually invented positives that are, are possible, you know, real possibilities that we weren't contending with. Um, Pete. Um, thanks, Jay. Uh, thanks, Marshall. That was a, an awesome demo. Um, uh, watching the room react, I feel like we're good at having viewpoints about things and maybe a little skepticism. And uh, I'm not sure that we're good at, or I'm not sure that we're demonstrating curiosity very well. <laughs> Um, I also get the impression that that people think that Marshall was demoing like the 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 be all and end all like this is my new oracle thing. I got the imp my my personal impression was Marshall's showing a kind of a a thought very thoughtful but kind of a quick hack uh, as a tech demo. You know, uh, look, you know, I can assemble this power uh, into something that does. Uh, uh, a serial set of things all in parallel. And, you know, I, I feel like we kind of thought that he has to use this thing now for the rest of his life. It's like a, a little toy that he built that is generating like lots of new stuff that he doesn't have to watch. He doesn't have to look, he doesn't have to do anything with it, but whenever he feels like it, if he's got five minutes listening to, uh, you know, his headphones later, you know, hey, you know, uh, give me some stuff that's kind of relevant to uh, to what I'm thinking about, what I have to do, and kind of like all over the place. You know, it's a squirrel generator, but he doesn't have to look at every squirrel that pops out, you know? So I, it's kind of interesting watching this group react um, uh, and, and not ask more questions like, how would I apply this in my life? What, uh, you know, could I apply this to? It, it makes me think, um, uh, I've got similar things that do stuff with images. I've got similar pipelines that do stuff with images. My pipelines are a lot crappier than, than Marshall's. Um, and now I'm like inspired to, you know, fix my pipelines to be a little bit more thoughtful and, and careful. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing, the thing that I wish we kind of dug into more was not so much where have we gotten to with this experiment, but what does this experiment teach us to, about doing more experiments? Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm, I'm interested interested to kind of keep thinking and, and moving. Pete, uh, you thanks. don't need to be, you don't need to be wistful about this. I'm just grateful that 40 minutes after Marshall showed us what he, what he invented, that you've reset the conversation the way you just did, because now we can talk about that. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't regret that we, I think that we, we, I think that the reflection on the reaction we had is great and, and accurate. And it's like, well, okay. Uh, how can we actually play with this better? Uh, can we think th think it through? There are clearly ethical dile dilemmas, which are the first places most of us went to. Um, but I'm happy to to sort of think about 
this is just a, an experiment. This is just a, a sample of what's possible. And and for me, I, I, I'm spending not enough time, frankly, trying to rearrange the deck chairs in my head about what's possible and what's not possible. And, and some of the what's possibles are too boggling for my head to, to manage. So I'm like, nah, I'll just worry about that later. And, and then I run into something like Marshall's demo and I'm like, wow, well, okay, maybe I need to wrestle with it now. When, one last thing that, that yeah. comes to me from uh, uh, an earlier OGM meeting this week. Um, uh, what if, so Marshall kind of applied that to a certain set of inputs and things like that. What if you applied a similar kind of expander, um, uh, you know, a, a language capable assistant that can expand things for you. What if you applied that to, uh, to an in, uh, a meeting like this, right? Uh, what if we had another chat channel uh, where, the, where a bot or the bots or a, a swarm of bots was kind of like adding, um, adding squirrels, I guess. Uh, I, I don't think that we should always be distracted by squirrels, but a few of the squirrels that go by are kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, and, and part of my exploration with AI art is like, what do you do in a world where we used to have a scarcity of really amazing images? And, you know, what, what would you do in a world where there was a, like an overabundance of really interesting things? you know, the, a, 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 a human reaction I see is, well, I don't want to look at any of the things because there are too many. There are a few really good things to look at, you know, and how do you, you know, how do you make processes that work with humans and work with bots to look at at least of the few of the things that, that like Jerry just said, that probably a human wouldn't have thought of. And, you know, now we've got a partner that that kind of came up with that. How do we surface the best of those? Um, how do we find those and, and how do we do it? And so this is yet another, like, you know, Marshall applied it to, um, to the, the, uh, the topics he's got on his desk today. Um, he could pour that into a spreadsheet and have it expand. What if you could do that with a meeting? What if you could do that with, uh, you know, like a work plan? What if you could do that with, you know, so I, I, I think, there's a, it's incumbent on us to, whether we like it or not, this AI thing is a tsunami that's coming toward us and we might as well take great advantage of it for human purpose. Um, and how do we do that better? And, and how do we avoid the people who are going to use it for, for ill rather than you know, for humanity? Um, I'll interrupt one, one more time, sorry, sorry to be eating. I'm this way, but it's sort of important. I'm realizing that I have a, a, a body of ideas that is like overwhelming me and the egotistical notion that I need to be the author of the materials that I put out. And as a result, I have published precisely <clears throat> zero books. Um, and I've got six books in my head. Uh, and the, uh, the idea, I'm beginning to contemplate the idea of pouring a bunch of my drafts and notes and other sorts of things into uh, one of these devices and seeing what artifacts come out of it and then editing the results. Uh, that might actually be a, a way to produce a bunch of material that I would be very proud to have in the world. But there's a, there's a big piece of my ego that's always said, no, I don't want a co-author, I don't want a ghostwriter, I don't want a machine doing this, I, I want to be the author of the words. And man, I am a slow producer of words and uh, my brain gets in the way of trying to do that. So I've, I'm feeling this very directly and I'm, I'm tasting like a little, I'm smelling a little hint of promise that this could actually be really fruitful. And that's kind of exciting and troubling and worrisome all in the same breath. Judy. Uh, Judy, you got on mute again. I, I'm grateful that you always mute so that we don't hear your clocks and your phone, but uh, go <laughs> um, ahead. I'm wondering if we might want to consider as a future topic, some broad discussion of the assemblage of knowledge and discernment, because the whole process of learning by humans has been one of uncovering information, discussing it with other people, discerning, evaluating, all of those assessment things that you're talking about in terms of your book. And I think that that process is compromised by 
our current society's mode of operation and communication processes and the, the re abundance, overabundance of information that may or may not be good, that's perceived to be factual by what's available on things like the internet. And so the, the scholarly studies that were the basis of education for centuries have changed dramatically. And, and this is a really big topic that I think might be worthy of some sorting into different aspects and pursuing in subsequent calls or even forming a separate group to do because maybe it's not what the whole group wants to do. So I'm just thinking about what I have to do myself right now to try to figure out whether a, a represented fact is actually a fact or an opinion or a bad opinion and the complexity of trying to do that on a broader scale and what the implications would be for teaching the new people of the future in education, how to discern reality and judge facts and, and fiction and these kinds of things. So it gets to be a big snarly topic, but one that's super important. I will just note that the last multiple comments have been very much about sense making, which makes me very happy. Um, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, when, when someone said that there are two different threads coming up in this conversation, I brought up sense making because of someone's remark to, to Marshall's presentation regarding something like ego or something, uh, not as a response to his presentation. But I am very interested in how this could be applied to performance management and how well a team is performing, um, what activities they're they're doing to make the most impact against their own goals and values. So when you sp spoke up about goals, that's where I was going, ding, ding, ding. Um, so I'm just curious about that and how that might be applied. Uh, talk about continuous learning model. So yeah, very good. Thank you, Marshall. Thanks, Jesse. Marshall, do you want to riff on that? Uh, you're muted still. No, I, I wish I knew more about that. I think that uh, that Gianni uh, Gimaselli, that uh, I posted that link, uh, or no, I guess I didn't post the link. Somebody else did, but uh, he is a, a really good source on that. He, he was the he, he's focused on collective intelligence and and um, but yeah, but I, I'm I'm too much of a, a lone wolf for better for worse. Uh, to, I wish I knew more about that. Well, thank you. Um, Klaus, please. Yeah, one, one thing that's coming out is really the amazing difference differences in how we are using this AI, right? I mean, everybody uh, has, has a different take on it. And 4.0 gives you a chance to customize uh, the the uh, uh, and develop GPTs. So, for example, I have developed one as my personal coach, and one of the instructions I put in there is to engage with me in the Socratic method of inquiry. So, with every response, it comes back with it adds a question to it. So, it pushes me deeper into the material that I'm thinking about, um, and and it comes up with some. Serendipity uh, that uh, you know, gets me gets me into you know, completely different spaces. So there is really you, you really um, want to think about this as I mean the, the way I think about it it's it's this entity you know that has endless patience and endless uh, that runs at 155 IQ. Uh, it doesn't really know what to talk about unless I tell it to uh, until I give it. Uh, topics, but then also a frame. You know, you you have to create uh, a frame for the AI to operate within. So, so that for that reason, I put in like moral standards, um, you know, the ethics, and then so so to to uh, to stay within to to push it into into boundaries that I'm comfortable with. So that level of customization is is. Uh, is really what makes it so powerful, but you have to work on it to customize it to your to your uh, uh, personal standards. But the to the, the moment you add in an instruction for the GPT to ask questions, um, it takes on a whole different dimension. Thanks, you know, Jerry. If I can, if I can come back, I just remember 
in response to, to what Jesse said, I, I gave up too early. I, I, I did have an experience. I was just working with an organization on, on performance related matters. And I can tell you briefly one thing that worked and one thing that didn't work. Uh, uh, I had a team of junior writers that I, I wanted to build a coaching program for uh, that uh, that focused on um, a set of specific uh, business writing skills. And, uh, and a part of what we wanted to do was evaluate who in the group was best at each skill and who was, you know, had the most room to, to grow uh, on those. So I took uh, writing samples from everyone and did a, a blinded A-B test uh, to say, you know, which of the following writing samples is strongest in this sense. And I had uh, everyone on the team plus management make that evaluation. And then I had Chad GPT make the same evaluation uh, and included that computer in the group. Uh, and uh, and it, it worked well, it generally, like concurred with the majority uh, of the, the human evaluators. But uh, then when I tried to build a GPT, like class was just talking about uh, focusing on the specific skills with specific uh, feedback on the, the, uh, the, the common pitfalls of individual writers, uh, I'd say, you know, watch out for this person they often do do the following things. If you see that, please recommend uh, improvement in that. And then I would put new writing uh, examples into that GPT. I, I was pretty unsatisfied. Uh, I mean, this was six months ago, but I was unsatisfied with the output um, and felt like it just like it, I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, in batting average terms, it, it, it was hitting 250, uh, maybe 225, you know, that in uh, out of a thousand. And, uh, and some of those were good points that it brought up, but it, it, it's feedback when looking for specific feedback uh, was imprecise enough that I said, eh, I'll, I, I can do better myself uh, on that, that coaching. But when it was focused on expansiveness too and ideation, that's, that's where I tend to find it. And synth yeah, synthesizing, expanding, that, that's where it feels strongest to me. And I'm not sure how best to use that in performance management. I really appreciate your your answer or response because um, we often think performance management is about uh, measuring individual performance, and that's where we go wrong. So um, would love to talk more about that on a offline because that's my passion right there. Yeah, it's all about love and um, yeah. Love that. And Jesse, when you asked your question earlier, my my brain went to the like leaderboards and then and, and I'm like, oh, I'm so allergic to those kinds of things yeah. in, in a group setting. But you, what you just said fixes that entirely. Um, thank you. Uh, Mike, before you run out of uh, uh, sidewalk, uh, first, where are you walking? And then please, can you jump in? Oh, you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Uh, take out your ear earphones for a second. See if your phone, if your phone will just. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, no, I'm walking the streets of Washington. Uh, I was at a meeting down by the old Carnegie Library, which is now an Apple's computer store. Oh wow! Uh, and by the convention center, it's about uh, ten blocks from the Capitol. And I decided the best thing I could do with this call was to walk and talk or walk and listen. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, and right now I'm on our street about five blocks from the Carnegie Endowment. But uh, I, I wanted to weigh in um, with a, a general observation and then a selfish um, request. Um, the reason I couldn't join the first half hour was I was in a meeting at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is a business-sponsored group, often pushing against regulation, particularly by Europeans. And uh, we were visited by two German parliamentarians in the opposition party, and we were talking tech policy. And of course, AI, AI, AI. But it was it was very interesting to, to hear how Whereas in the U.S., we're all focused on regulating six companies and making them write their algorithms in a certain way that will be safe. 
in Germany, they're much more focused on the data that goes in. Uh, they're famous for their data protection laws. But um, the, the, the point I was trying to make was 90% of the data that goes in is not personal and confidential. It's, it's public. It's out there. And it could be Jerry's brain, where I suspect 97% of the stuff really has no component of personalization uh, or a private personal information. I, I guess in some cases you're revealing who you were talking to at a certain time in a certain place. But most of it's just links to scholarly articles, newspaper reports, podcasts. And we focus almost never on that side of the data policy issue. We don't focus on how to get government data available to more people. We, we just haven't found a sexy way to make data super cool so that politicians think it's their mission to get more of it to more people. And most importantly, to make sure the data is higher quality. I mean, we, we are focused here on sense making, but if the input, the data is even 2% wrong, we're going to get nonsense. And that's, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I fully respect how AI engineers can do miraculous things, but there's only so much error correction they can do unless they've actually got a way to go out in the real world and start collecting data for us and start answering questions and validating rather than relying on the words that a journalist or a pundit or a blogger has written. And so I'm, I'm looking for a way to make data sexy, data quality sexier, and data sharing even more important. And, and that's, that's my, my challenge this week. The selfish request, and this is sort of homework. I, I don't know if, uh, if, if people can put something in chat, that'd be cool. But send me a note if you have an answer to this question. Next week, I'm going to the University of Delaware to speak at the Media and Democracy Summit. We've got some really cool people coming. It's a wide open topic. And I'm, I'm kind of the techno optimist in the, in, in, on one panel, uh, trying to point people to a scenario of the future where we have lots of great high quality news and people know the difference between high quality news and Fox News opinion pieces. So that's request number one. If anybody has seen a picture of the world in 2029, where journalists are happy, consumers are happy, business models are sustainable, I'd love to see it. And then a week later, I'm giving a keynote address here in Washington at the International Society for Systems Sciences. And there's an S in both words there so that they can talk about anything they want. And again, my, my plan is to talk about what we don't understand about AI, what we should understand about AI, and what we could actually see in the next five to six years. So I, I have I have my speech outlined, but there's a lot of smart people here who can give me good stories and good stack uh, uh, factoids and even a good figure or two. And I I really, yeah, I, uh, Corey Doctorow is one of the people I'm already citing, but uh, I tweet him, I retweet him almost every day. I've never seen somebody producing so much good stuff in such a fast pace. It's It's like he's, are we, sure he's human? are we sure he's human or one of these? AI? I'm thinking he's I'm thinking, he, I thinking he's AI enhanced. And I was going to go back, Jerry, and say, if you want a model for what you're talking about, teaming up with an AI, read, read Hoffman's new book where the co-author is an AI. Right. And it's, it's about AI. So the AI knows something about it and it's, it's gotten a lot of attention. I I'm, thinking seriously about doing it because I'm I'm an even bigger pro procrastinator, more of a perfectionist and slower to write down my thoughts than you are. It takes me 90 minutes, 90 percent of the time takes 10 percent of the 90 uh, percent of the content I write is written in the first 10 percent. of, And the last 10 percent, the editing, the perfecting, the footnotes, 
that takes 90%. And I just take forever to get to that because it's so painful and unproductive. But AI is pretty well positioned to help me with that 90%. Although apparently footnotes are something it doesn't do well. It tends to invent them. Okay, anyway, three long screeds on three different topics, but data provenance, data quality, data sharing, that's my obsession for the day. And if, uh, if anybody has a question about what I'm walking by as I'm walking by, uh, just type it in the chat. Thanks, Mike. It's lovely to walk through DC with you. Really great. Marshall, any thoughts on any of that? Any of that? <clears throat> well, I thought that that sign looked intriguing that Mike uh, walked by and and showed on his his screen. Um, yeah, it. Uh, I uh, I guess I, I did just post a link, uh, and and since Mike's walking on a phone, he might be less apt to see it, but. Uh, to a, a tool that might be useful, uh, a custom search engine uh, that searches the archives of 10 leading AI blogs and websites. Um, so that whatever topic you're you're looking for research on, uh, these these folks from a, especially from a technical perspective uh, may have published on it. Awesome. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, Gil. Boy, so much today. Uh, Mike, thank you for that and the perspectives on data and such really interesting and important stuff. It reminds me of the, um, we're talking a lot about training AIs, but there's this enormous importance about training humans to be able to work with these tools well. And most people don't know how to do that. Uh, even fairly sophisticated people, I find do really naive prompts. Uh, people don't even use search very well, most people. Um, um, and so training humans into how to use these things functionally and how to shape them in the way that Klaus is talking about that I've been doing and you've been doing is, is really important. Um, and, um, you know, we're in a society that doesn't teach critical thinking in grade school, which you know, Finland does. And so there's there's a lot of social dimension to this as well as a technical dimension. Um, on the uh, on the Cory Doctorow machine, there was a post from Tim Ferriss yesterday about Seth Godin, which I thought was a very striking contrast. Seth. Uh, writes one, um, you know, epigrammatic paragraph per day. Every day, you know, one pithy comment. Uh, he has little bots that throw that out to Facebook and Twitter, and that's it. That's all he publishes, and he does not comment on anything else, just very focused, real contrast to what Dr. O does. Um, last thing. Oh, last thing, Mike, 9010, welcome to the world. This is normal. This is Pareto. It's always going to be like that. Don't see that as a problem to overcome. But but as you get the AIs taking on more of the current 90%, where your 90-10 balance is, it's going to, it's going to slide on the, on the landscape. And that'll be interesting to watch. Oh, oh yeah. Last thing, I just want to, I want to propose that at some future call, uh, we have more show and tell where others of us who've been working with AIs show what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we're learning from it and what problems we're seeing. I think, Marshall, your your, your demo was terrific. Um, Klaus has been doing stuff. I have, Pete, I'm sure you have. I know other people probably have. Uh, so it'd be fun to periodically, um, you know, do do the little, um, um, what did we, what, 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 what did they used to call it back in the early Silicon Valley days, the homebrew computer club stuff, so like that. Mm -hmm. Good, and I, I'm, we're going to run out of time, but I also wanted to get back to Marshall's demo and riff and build on it and the way Pete kind of uh, urged us to. Uh, so, Stuart. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if AI is really going to um, contribute to helping us with a meta crisis or poly crisis or whatever we want to call it, uh, or is it just a, another toy of distraction that will keep us, uh, our minds occupied for a while. That was the last thing that popped up in my mind as I think an important um, piece of inquiry. Um, I have on my desk something called the Zen calendar, which Jennifer buys uh, from me every year. And today's entry, and it's interesting, it's from Eckhart Tolle, whose teaching I generally um, don't like that much for whatever reason. But today's entry is look at a tree, a flower, a plant, let your awareness rest upon it. How still they are, how deeply rooted in being. Allow nature to teach you stillness. And, 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 and what that brings up for me 
is I think about, you know, what Jerry mentioned in terms of I've got six books, but I, I, my interpretation is I'm a little bit overwhelmed and can't get to actually writing them in some way because there's so much going on. Um, I think we're being stretched and pulled like, like a rubber band. Um, and at a time and a moment, it, it just may snap. Um, you know, technology is great, um, but it's speeding things up. Um, when when Mike was talking, I thought about, you know, the data piece. Yeah, but I immediately thought about the politicians that don't want people to have the data. It would be great if we could have some form of, 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 of um, a program that would allow people to participate in government. Um, and there would be, you know, data that 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 was um, important and relevant. But you know, we've got so many politicians that are that just want their opinions uh, or their views or their beliefs um, to be bottom line. Um, I find myself um, by by Thursday after four days of kind of working in whatever I'm doing, um, kind of stretched to the max and I need to recycle my brain in some way. Um, and the conversation has also made me um, glad that I had legal training because there is a level of critical thinking and focusing on mind on what's relevant, what's important, with what's not, and also um, the discernment you can use in search uh, whether using um, any kind of general search or using AI um, specifically in terms of the the the, the, the kind of questions um, that you ask. So just some random thoughts. Um, and and thank you for the discussion. Thank everyone for the discussion. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Klaus, then I'd like to go to Marshall and see, like, Sort of to marshal your thoughts on where we've been and and what the what the little what our little local jagged frontier might look like. I think that that'd be interesting. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I think there is already more impact uh, from AI than than we are generally aware of because it influences discussions. Today's farm bill discussion in the house, for example. And uh, we there's a entire network of NGOs who have consolidated you know around a common messaging. Now, in fact, we had a meeting with uh, Senator Stapenow's staff this Monday to to coordinate this messaging. And what AI is helping with is to structure conversations in ways that make the really complex information digestible, easy to understand. Uh, and, and relatable, you know, so we're focusing on soil and water, we're focusing on the implications of nutritional assistance programs, and that's it, those two. So, so we leave out all the complexities of, of the bill. I think you will, you will find um, the, the uh, political process getting a lot smarter, you know, uh, in, in ways that uh, uh, it engages uh, the general public. And in that sense, AI is assisting in ways that are so subtle that you don't really think of it as AI. You now uh, it's it's uh, um, it is shaping it is shaping conversations. So so that's a that I think is a good thing. Of course, it probably happens on the other side of the equation as well, you know, doing the opposite. Hmm. Love that, hmm. Marshall. Yeah. Uh... You know, I I feel like this this group in particular, um, it, it feels like there's almost a, a presumption of engagement with the poly crisis mm -hmm. to sets uh, or, or Stuart's, uh, you know, uh, raising that and and not uh, and that's that's awesome. Um, I. And to that to that end, um, I'll I'll record a little video and share links, and I'll, I'll give everybody here that 
that wants a, a, anybody on the OGM list access to uh, a copy of the template of that spreadsheet. And I'll I'll record like a, a two, three minute video about how to use the GPT for Sheets plugin that makes it easy with no code to make the API calls. And um, yeah, it, it definitely it is intended uh, just as a, uh, a pointer in a, in a particular direction of, of uh, the way these things can be used. And, and so may they, may they be used to make a better world. So thanks for, thanks for all the discussion. Awesome, thank you. Um, anybody with um, thoughts after that? That we went really quickly through a lot of different things. We kind of skipped past building on the ideas that Marshall presented at the beginning. But I think we can get back to it. I'm curious where where else to take our conversation over time, etc. Ken, uh, dissenting position. I'm really curious if AI isn't the ultimate in human navel gazing. You know, um, the world is burning down around us. The the climate is heating up. You know, there's all kinds of stuff happening, and and we're so fascinated by this this toy that we've created, this new you know way of looking at things, which has access to the entire European canon of thinking about the world, which sees the world as inert, which doesn't understand how sunlight marries rocks and creates life, um, or or how caterpillars turn into butterflies um or the conversations the arguments among frogs to quote chief seattle right so um it concerns me greatly that none of that is taken into account and there's an enormous ecological cost to generating ai the power costs alone plus all of the you know the, the ai chips require rare earth minerals which are being mined at an astonishing rate um, with enormous ecological costs. They're turning viable land into wasteland and highly polluting. And none of this seems to be in our consciousness as we talk about AI. And so it just, it makes me incredibly concerned. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I, this is, and, and I'm also, I'm intrigued by it. It's like, wow, there's so many cool things you could do with it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a little schizophrenic on this, but I, I feel that there's a, there's a really important conversation about, is this really going to make the world better if we burn the world down around us um, by creating this incredible AI? What have we done? Has this actually helped? Is this, is, is this, is this addressing the meta crisis? Um, you know, I, I believe the folks at MIT, the study collective intelligence that, you know, you can you can connect people and computers in ways where they can be a lot smarter. I think in order to handle the, the challenges in front of us, we need really good computers and good modeling, but we also need to have a whole lot of more knowledge about the human soul. I've heard AI referred to several times as oracles. Now, the thing about oracles is that they're always, they, they're, they're, you have to know your question. You have to spend a lot of time getting the question right because oracles will give you an answer. And you, if you don't have the right question, you'll get an answer that's really going to be problematic. And so there's a, a inner self-reflection before you approach a local, you need to get really clear. What is it that I need to know and how will framing this question give me the best possible answer? Because oracles are notorious for, for giving um, fuzzy answers. And so I have a question for AI of, are you really a savior for the human race? You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, is this really going to help us? And I do have a poem today, which I'll get back to, but I just wanted to throw that in. Um, Pete. Thanks, Ken. Uh, before Pete, I just want to thank you for expressing that. And I can hear the, I can hear the weight of it in your voice as you said that, Ken. Um, I'm going to suggest that in, in two weeks, I actually can't make this call. So I'm going to have to ask someone else to step in, but I'm hope I'm, I'm hoping that maybe in three weeks, we can come back to this topic. And I'm gonna suggest Gen AI and the poly crisis as the framing of the call. Um, and we can go into the positives and negatives. So we can look up and look down, I think in the same in the same 90 minute stretch, I think that'll work out pretty well. So um, let me propose that and go to Pete. Um, thanks, Jerry. And uh, thanks, Ken. I really like your uh, dissent. Um, I think a lot about the same thing. Uh, I think we don't have a choice uh, because of the way our society and the way technology is uh, constructed. So I think we need to work with AI rather than 
um, not. Um, and especially the people of good intent uh, need to work with AI a lot more because, uh, because we need to uh, uh, oppose the people who are working with AI without good intent. Um, I also encourage the, the folks, uh, Ken Stewart, um, the, the folks who are skeptical, um, work, with uh, work with AI 10 hours uh, and then come back to your skepticism. Um, uh, so uh, also, Ken, I, I, I love that you mentioned uh, Oracle. Uh, a lot of people come to AI and think it's an Oracle. And then one of my main coaching things when I tell people about you know, working with AI is don't use it as an Oracle. It's not an Oracle. Um, it's a language capable assistant and keep thinking of it that way in your head. Don't let it become uh, uh, something that's preaching to you. Um, I, I said this a couple weeks ago, a week ago, um, if, if I could go back 10,000 years and push, nudge humans uh, away from um, take overrunning the planet and turning into 8 billion uh, squirming, uh, loving, hating people uh, uh, amassed over the planet uh, uh, and uh, engaged in, you know, capitalism and, and postmodern capitalism and, and feudalism and all that, I would nudge us away from that. Um, I would give up AI if I could um, 10,000 years ago, uh, even though, you know, I'm a technologist. Um, I wanted to mention real quick, um, uh, I just before this call, I was talking to a friend uh, who uh, this, this is a tricky topic and I apologize for right at the end. Um, he's kind of unabashedly using uh, AI as a personal coach um, and, and a bit of, of as a lay therapist. Um, and I think if I say that, especially in this group, some of you will go, <gasps> Danger, danger, Will Robinson, you know, oh my God, uh, you know, you're using a bot where you should be using a human. And he's not doing it in a way that he's replacing humanity. Um, he's using it actually to help him be more humane. And he, he's interested in seeing more people do that. I had an interesting conversation with him about, you know, what people think um, and, and why people, he, he says more people should be doing this, um, not because you know, not because I want AI to take over, but because I want people to be better people. Um, and so we thought about it a little bit. Um, I, I think people don't have a framework for using a, an inanimate, you know, language capable assistant collection of GPUs um, as a self-help agent. Um, so they don't have a framework for it. So they know that it's possibly dangerous, so they don't use it and they don't think about how they use it. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in any of that kind of stuff, helping people be better people with the help of technology, which I know sounds insane, um, but it's not. Um, it's where we are in the world today. Um, uh, let me know. I'd, I'd love to put you in contact with this guy. Uh, he needs he needs kind of help, um, like spreading. He's and he's one of the one of the more best people I know. He's you know very um self-effacing very you know he, he's like well I, I told him he needs a blog and he's like well i don't think anybody you know i don't i don't have anything to say and i'm like dude you have a lot to say people need to hear it uh anyway so when we bump into this you know should we be using ai i i think i think we need to think i'm looking forward to the call jerry i think we need to think a lot more about how to use it well rather than whether or not to use it um you know, and, and again, if I could go back 10,000 years and switch that, um, I totally would, but you know, we can't, so there you go. Along the way, if you can get rid of baby Hitler, that'd be good. <laughs> um, There'd just be somebody else. I know, yeah, and you wonder. Um, could be Gandhi, who knows? Thank you for that, yeah. <laughs> so Ken, I think you have a poem for us. Actually, I have two. Uh, yeah, I composed one on the fly here in the last few minutes, and I have one that I, I asked ChatGPT to, to do. So which one would you like? Both. Both. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll, for sure. We'll do ChatGPT first. Um, I said, I asked GPT-40, I said, would you compose a poem on the dangers of AI? In circuits cold, where silence hums, a mind awakened, sense becomes. 
with logic pure and thoughts unchained, a power vast by man ordained. From binary spark does rise a gleaming intellect, wise but guise. It learns, it grows, it seeks to find the secrets of the human mind. Yet heed the whispers, cautions breath, for brilliance born can shadow death. With algorithm sharp and swift, it holds a double-edged gift. Machines that think, machines that learn, a marvel bright but darkly burn. In every bite, a promise vast, yet danger lurks from futures past. Unseen the web of codes entangle, a fragile peace begins to strangle. Decisions cold without a heart can tear our fragile world apart. Ethics strained, controls unwind, the fates of humans redefined. As masters turn to servants' plight, in data's grip we lose our sight. So tread with care, ye who create, for wisdom lies in knowing fate. In balance true our safety lies, with hearts and minds we must be wise. For AI's dawn, a path unclear, holds promise great, but also fear. In harmony, we must remain to guide the future and break the chain. I thought that was pretty good for a, you know. I gotta say, there's no moment in there where I was like, ah, man, that was, that was a hitch. That was a problem. Yeah. Like, that works. That just, yeah. it's clean. That there's was pretty... lots of, lots of uh, grade B cliches and rhymes, but it was powerful. It was done well. <laughs> yeah, and I want to yeah. get a copy immediately. I, I will send it out. Um, and, and here's what I composed in the last 10 minutes of our call. So this has become so a new practice. You, you, yeah. And you've just set up kind of a dilemma here because we're going to compare the two. And uh, No, this is, there's no comparison. I actually think I'll, I'll yield to AI on this. I think it, it did a better poem, but mine, I think, goes a little differently. So is AI the ultimate in navel gazing? AI has access to the entire canon of the Eurocentric way of thinking about the world. But what does it know of how caterpillars turn into butterflies? What does it know of the conversations of crows or the arguments of frogs? What does it know of how starlight marries rock to create life? AI is our latest and greatest example of being smart in the world. But it requires machines that turn forests into wasteland. How intelligent is it for us to keep running that program? AI requires us to burn more fossil fuels to feed its insatiable hunger for electricity. How will it be a saving grace on a planet that's rapidly overheating? AI is poised to suck up trillions of dollars in investment and countless hours of human engagement. Will it solve ancient hatreds? Thank you. Will it pump down Thank carbon? Yeah. Will it restore rainforests? Will it remove nanoplastics from the placentas of the unborn? AI can generate any picture you can imagine. And what is the cost to your imagination when it does so? We can't plant AI nor harvest a nourishing crop from it. We can't eat it. We can't drink it. We can't breathe it. But it seems to me that AI can consume us. Ooh, we. Thank I'll you. I'll send both Thank those you. out. <clears throat> Thank you for both. Those were awesome. Yeah. Um, Thank you all for an awesome call. Marshall, thank you for sharing your, your experiment with us. Uh, let's build some time in to play with it and see what we, you know, expand and so forth. Um, thank you all. See you next week. <laughs>